Hello, everyone. Thanks for being there today. Um, this session is part of the Kiverno Maintainers track. We will explore some real-world integrations and recent cutting-edge cutting updates. So first up, let's do a quick round of introductions. I'm Charles-Edouard Bretéché, a Kiverno maintainer working at Nirmata and working exclusively on Kiverno and open source projects. Um, with me are my fantastic co-speakers, so Karen and Lanting. Can you tell us a word about you? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Lanting. I work on the container orchestration team of Robinhood. And hello, I'm Karen. Um, Lanting and I work together to integrate Caverno into Robinhood stack. Awesome. Uh, today, Lanting and Karen will kick things off by sharing their experience integrating Caverno into their platform. Uh, after that, I lead us to a deep dive into Kiverno's reporting system and highlight the latest improvements. So let's get started. Karen, can you start and present the agenda? Okay, so just a quick overview of what we're actually going to talk about. So Lansing and I will start off with discussing why we actually decided to choose Caverno out of all of the options that we had, and then the process that we followed to actually install Caverno and do some of um, the migrations, and also talk about the strategy for storing policies as code. And then we will pass it off to Charles to talk about um, one of the new features in Caverno. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of context. So um, for those of you that don't know, Robinhood is a brokerage firm, so there are quite strict security and compliance requirements, which makes um, strong policy enforcement capabilities essential in our Kubernetes clusters. And this is kind of a slide that represents the state of the world before we installed Caverno. So, we had um, pod security policies that we used, which um, was a part of um, Kubernetes. I say was um, because it is actually um, removed in the most recent versions. Um, but we were using pod security policies to enforce things like whether a pod could use um, the host network, for example. And then the next um, part of Kubernetes um, native that we used is um, RBAC, just for managing um, permissions to different resources. So this is just through things like cluster roles and cluster role bindings. And finally, for the things that native um, PSPs and RBAC can cover, we used our in-house admission server. So this is just um, a deployment of um, a admission server running as Go code with Go code, and um, in combination with a webhook configuration, and we can write like arbitrary policies using that. So I'm going to talk about a few problems with the setup. So I talked about how in the most recent versions of Kubernetes, pod security policies are actually deprecated. Um, they were replaced with pod security admission, and we had some problems with RBAC as well. There are some things that we wanted to do, um, such as having fine grain enforcement, like having wildcard matching for a resource name, which is not actually supported um, in Kubernetes native RBAC. So um, actually to get around that, we could use our in-house admission server, but with our in-house admission server, we also faced a whole suite of issues. So our team um, was the, and still is, the owner of the admission server code itself, but there are other infrastructure teams that want to also contribute different admission policies. Um, and for other teams, it was actually kind of difficult to do this because they didn't fully understand the deploy strategy. They didn't understand the whole structure of the code. So it was quite a toily process um, for them to actually write this code. And um, beyond that, there um, were some things that weren't abstracted away in the admission server, such as um, having a understanding of how um, informers work, which not all in infrastructure teams fully understood. So because of all of these issues, we decided that we needed to kind of uh, make an improvement, and we had a few different options. So um, yeah, so this is a slide that summarizes all the options we had. I didn't include um, Kiverno on here, because I'll actually go uh, more in depth about that later. But 
Um, first, talking about um, the pod security policy replacement, which is pod security and mission. Pretty early on, we decided that that wasn't a good fit for us because pod security admission requires that you kind of categorize everything into three categories, and we wanted something more fine green than that, so we needed, we needed something else other than pod security admission. The other option that we had was to just improve our in-house admission server. We could um, choose to have our engineering time spent on actually um, having a much better framework that's easier for people to contribute, to have better protections, um, to prevent people <laughs> from landing bugs just because they don't understand um, how informers work. And um, yeah, so this was something that was on the table, but we also felt that um, because our team actually owns quite a few components, um, if there is a solution that exists out there that already has this, it's not really worth our effort to basically um, reinvent something. So um, this is kind of the short list that we had of the different um, open source or third-party admission servers that existed. So um, one of them was Daytree, which we didn't, we kind of eliminated early on as well because it required having central policy management and not um, having policy management internally. So we didn't like that. And then the next one, we actually looked at JS policy, which was pretty attractive at first for a few reasons. Um, it's very flexible, and the team behind it also made a lot of pretty popular um, Kubernetes projects. But once we took a closer look, we realized it really was not production ready. It was missing um, a lot of basic capabilities um, related to tracing and metrics, and it also wasn't used um, at least we didn't find any uh, use cases at scale, and we didn't want to be the guinea pigs <laughs> for that, so we decided not to go with JS policy either. So um, in the end, we had two serious contenders, which were um, Open, um, sorry, OPA, Open Policy Agent, and Caverno. So both OPA and Caverno um, hit all of our hard requirements. Um, except that OPA had one big drawback, which is that the policy language used for OPA is Rego. And um, unfortunately at Robinhood, well, maybe fortunately, <laughs> depending on your perspective, um, we don't have a history of using Rego. And that was not good because um, arguably it would be harder to write a policy in Rego using OPA than to just use our existing in-house admission server and write Go code. So yeah, like what would be the point of installing something new if it's um, just as or more difficult to use? So for those reasons, in the end, Caverno ended up being um, the winner out of all of the choices. And I mentioned that it hit all of our hard requirements, so um, that's kind of listed out on the slide here. The first is that we wanted to um, yeah, constrain um, any arbitrary um, requests to the Kubernetes API, and because Caverno is an admission controller, it satisfies that. And one important thing that comes with Caverno is some more mature tooling than what we had in our in-house admission server. So um, it's, it has a tool to actually um, audit the existing resources in the cluster. So if you write a policy, you can actually check to see how many of the existing resources it would reject. And with our in-house admission server, we had to write custom scripts for um, each policy that we wrote, which is not very sustainable. And finally, Caverno policies are pretty easy to write. So they are um, written in YAML, and um, any Kubernetes engineer is pretty familiar with using YAML, so we were confident that other infrastructure teams would be able to learn this pretty quickly. And I have a diagram here just to show um, the setup that we have with Caverno currently. So we don't actually use all of the features. We mainly just um, rely on the policies and then some of like the more basic parts of the admission controller. So we don't use the reporting feature or the background scans and that's because in our initial testing, um, we actually had some problems with um, etcd storage getting filled up by reports, but Charles will actually talk about how um, Caverno has worked on improving that, so it might be a feature that we will use in the future. And these are some of the bonuses that we get with Caverno, so not um, in any of our hard requirements, but definitely nice to have. 
So Caverno has a pretty extensive um, repository of policies that you can pull from. So when we were switching over from our pod security policies to Caverno policies, it was really nice to be able to um, model off of existing ones that were very similar to what we wanted to do. And those even come with um, integration tests and unit tests as well. And another great thing about Caverno is that it is actively maintained. Um, the supporters are very responsive. <laughs> and um, yeah, we definitely didn't want to be using a deprecated tool and have to end up maintaining that on our own. So this is pretty important for us. And finally, Caverno has a pretty mature testing framework. There is a CI, CLI tool that you can use, which does kind of the equivalent of unit testing. And there are also integration test tooling provided. And that was really great compared to our in-house admission server, which didn't really have much enforcement of testing. It's kind of like you write a test if someone like does the proper code review, if you remember, which, you know, of course is not <laughs> a great strategy for having good test coverage. So um, just to give you a bit of an overview for um, how this process actually looked like, we did the evaluation early last year. So kind of a while ago, that's when we were facing problems with um, infra teams, not having a good time writing um, the custom admission plugins, and also hitting some issues with RBAC not being customizable, and then pod security policies getting deprecated. So that's when we knew we had to look for other options. Um, and because of prioritization <laughs> and different um, yeah, company objectives, we ended up starting to work on it at the beginning of this year. So we did some initial testing, and once that was complete, then we worked on actually integrating Caverno um, into our platform. So that meant actually setting up like all the testing framework to like automatically run at build time, and just to make it easy for people to contribute policies. And once that was done, then we started actually migrating all of our pod security policies into Caverno policies, which Lanting we'll talk um, more in depth about. And once that was complete, then we made the stance, no more validating um, custom plugins in our in-house admission server, um, unless there's a very good reason <laughs> that it can't be done with Caverno. Um, and that's so that we can kind of stop the bleeding um, for people contributing and adding more to something that we want to get rid of. And we're currently in the process of upgrading Caverno to a newer version to get some performance improvements um, in order to unblock us to do the work of moving more admission server um, plugins into Caverno policies and then having the same stance that we did for validating policies um, for mutating policies so that we can remove our custom admission server as much as possible. And now I will pass it off to Lanting. Yeah, so I will talk a bit more about how we did the P PSP migration in detail. Um, so from this graph, um, you can see that we first write a Kubernetes cluster policy um, in audit mode. It's a YAML file, um, and we deploy it in the cluster. What audit mode means is that, for example, if we have a validating policy, um, if there is a resource that violates what the policy validates against, um, it will still be able to get created, but the violation will be logged, and we can go in and look at those logs and address the violation. Um, either we uh, codify this violating workload as an exception, or um, we try to help them use something else that does not violate this policy. So um, after a period of bake time, we're sure that, OK, this policy won't break anything. Then we change it to enforce mode. Um, at this point, if anything violates the policy, it will not be successfully created or updated. Um, and we continue baking for a while. And once we are certain that Kubernetes cluster policies fully replace the functionality of pod security policies and they don't break anything, we delete the pod security policies. Um, and we turn off the pod security policy admission controller from the API server. Um, and the specific validation that PSPs fully replace, um, sorry, 
uh, cluster policies fully replace PSPs is done by testing. Um, so we deploy integration tests written with the Kiberno Chainsaw framework in the cluster. Um, it's in the form of like try creating a pod, validate that this pod successfully gets created or it doesn't successfully get created because it's blocked by this policy. Um, so that way um, we don't really need to do any manual action here to validate the behavior. Um, one thing to note is that the audit mode only exists for validating policies. So if you have mutating policies, they go straight to mutating your resources. So a bit more caution needs to be done with testing there. Um, and next I will talk about our break glass scenarios. So if we have a policy that's blocking something really critical from coming up or it's breaking something, um, easiest way is to delete that policy um, and then figure out things from there. Um, if uh, somehow we want to exempt an entire namespace from Kubernetes enforcement, we can use Kubernetes namespace filters. So typically we exempt Kube system and the Kubernetes namespace itself from Kubernetes admission control to prevent any deadlocks. Um, and if somehow we just see like very high latencies in the cluster due to admission control, like something's broken, we don't know what yet, um, well, we can still scale down the deploy, uh, the Kiberno deployment to zero replicas or just delete the deployment. Um, what this does is it also deletes the validating webhook configurations and mutating webhook configurations that are managed by Kiberno. So the API server stops sending requests over to Kiberno um, and we will figure out from there. Um, and if all that fails for some reason, we can disable the validating admission webhook and mutating admission webhook plugins from the API server. Um, there are flags on the API server where you can list what admission webhooks you enable. Um, so these are our break glass scenarios. Um, and I'll talk a bit about our policy structure. Um, so for each feature that we want to govern, so for example, if we only want our pods to use the following list of volumes, um, we have one policy that selects all resources in the cluster by default. Um, and we can exclude certain pods based on namespace and labels. So um, these would be our exception use cases. For example, if a pod really wants to use host path, okay, we can exclude it from this policy so it doesn't get blocked. Now the problem then becomes there's nothing governing this pod. So it can not only use host path, it can use like star, it can use whatever it wants. Um, so we create the second policy that selects the excluded resources and validates what they use. So um, with a combination of these two types of policies, we select all resources in the cluster, um, validate some default thing while allowing for exceptions. And Finally, I will talk about how we do testing. Um, so Karen mentioned previously that Kiverno offers some really nice testing frameworks. Um, so typically, we start with a Kiverno CLI test that we run as a unit test um, at, um, I guess, build time. Um, so the test structure is as follows. Um, you select, you import um, some test resources, you import the policy that you want to test against, and then you declare something like, this pod evaluated against this rule from this policy should result in a pass, or it should result in a skip because it's excluded, or it should result in a failure because it violates the policy rule and it failed. Um, so very easy declarative testing. Um, and this can just be run locally from your command line. Um, and another test that we write is using the Kiverno Chainsaw Framework. So these are end-to-end -end tests that we deploy in our CD pipeline. Um, and the structure is like the following. You try creating a pod and you assert the behavior of um, this pod creation. So same thing, um, it would successfully be created and maybe these fields would be added to the pod spec because there's a mutating policy, et cetera. Um, so this, CL, this chainsaw test actually creates resources in the cluster and cleans it up and it runs every time our CD pipeline runs. Um, and with a combination of these two types of tests, we're pretty confident that our policies won't break anything. Um, 
And this will conclude the Robin Hood journey section. And we're giving thanks to Bishan, Sujith, Madhu, and Nick, people who helped us on this project. Next, I will pass it on to Charles to talk about Kiverno's improvements. Thank you. Uh, that's great feedback. That's really interesting to have this kind of feedback and how Kiverno can help uh, when integrated in um, existing platforms, even with existing solutions. Um, on my side, I will continue this presentation focusing on Kiverno's reporting system and deep dive into an exciting new component, the um, Kiverno report server. Uh, the problem is that when Kiverno operates at large scale, the amount of reports generated and managed by Kiverno can be huge and consume a lot of storage. Um, this can lead to problematic situations where the storage system capacity becomes a, a bottleneck uh, and eventually impacts the whole cluster operation. Um, so to understand the challenges um, better, Let's start with exploring how Kiverno's reporting system works and the type of reports it generates and uses. So the first uh, type of report needed is uh, when a request is submitted to the API server. Um, the API server will call into Kiverno to validate or mutate the resource being processed, and based on the policies installed in the cluster, it produces results. And these results is what we call an admission time report. Um, so, yes, uh, keep in mind that there's no guarantee that the webhook will be called only once. Uh, when there are multiple webhooks, sometimes a webhook can be called uh, until the the, um, the mutated resource stabilizes, um, <clears throat> or that the submitted resource will uh, ultimately reach the cluster. So maybe another webhook is going to reject the resource, so we potentially generate results for a resource that will never exist. Um, so therefore, reports generated at this stage um, are intermediary and may be processed at the later stage, or even in some cases, it may be just discarded. Um, and of course, uh, there's, uh, every admission time report is unique, uh, and it can, it can grow to an infinite number. Uh, every admission request will generate a different admission time report. So that's the first case where Kiverno needs to generate a report. Uh, the second one is uh, when a policy or resource changes in the cluster or eventually on a predefined schedule to make sure reports are up to date even when something changes externally. Uh, in these cases, Kiverno fetches all managed resources, all matching resources for a given policy. It evaluates the policies against the resources and produce, produces new ephemeral reports, this time background scan reports. Um, they are limited to at most one per resource. Uh, we don't need to generate more than one. Uh, so the number of them is completely under control but they are still intermediary reports and kept for later processing. So they will have to be somehow combined with admission time reports to produce the final report. Uh, and of course, even if they are ephemeral reports that are not supposed to persist for a long time in the cluster, they can create a lot of storage activity and still consume storage space. Finally, uh, we have a third type of report, which is called a policy report. This time, it is a long line report. Um, every policy report belongs to a specific resource, and it shares the same life cycle. When the resource is deleted from the cluster, the report is deleted from the cluster. When the resource changes, the report is updated, and so on. Um, those policy reports are built by um, aggregating together the ephemeral reports created 
earlier. So at admission time and eventually background scan time. So to do that, Kiverno fetches all ephemeral reports from the API server and therefore the underlying storage. It aggregates them together with the current policy report, if, if any. Uh, it updates the policy report um, so in the storage again. And ultimately, it deletes all the ephemeral reports that have been processed at this stage. So yes, it does this. Update the policy report and delete ephemeral reports that have been processed. So uh, that's it. This is the only way we can get a consistent report in a distributed system. We can generate partial reports and eventually update the final report because uh, one request can go through one API server, another request can go through another API server uh, in a highly available mode. You don't have a single API, uh, API server. Uh, and now we know everything about how reports are created and the interactions with the API server and storage. It's obvious that it takes a lot of read, write, and delete operations to get the final reports. Of course, this can impact the API server in one way or another. So it can increase the API server load, degrade performance, and it also poses a significant operational risk because if ETCD uh, is in trouble, API server is in trouble, the scheduler is in trouble, the whole cluster is in trouble. Um, and ETCD has capacity limits. So it's clear that we need to move the report system out of ETCD if we want to support large-scale clusters. And here we are. Um, fortunately, the API server API aggregation layer enables just that by allowing different APIs to be handled by separate services, each service having its own storage. So a typical example is the metric server most of us have installed in their clusters. It's available in the API server, but it is implemented in an independent service and with its own storage. Usually it's in memory and it keeps in memory the different metrics. So you ask the API server, but the API server doesn't itself serve the metrics. It delegates this to another service in the cluster. And the report server follows the exact same pr principle. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, at the top, Kiverno and Trivi are communicating with the API server. Uh, depending on the request, the API server will either handle it directly and uh, interact with the cluster ETCD storage. So it's on the left on the diagram. If you request a config map, a pod, anything, it will be directly handled by the API server and ETCD. Uh, if the request is about an ephemeral report or a policy report, the API server will delegate handling to the report server on the right, and the report server can then use the storage of choice. Uh, it can be a Postgres database, it can be a separate ETCD if you want, it can store reports in memory, but if you have a lot of memory, why not? Um, but in the end, the report system has its own storage and logic. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, that was the goal. So finally, um, with the report server, all the report management stuff is now offloaded from the API server to the report server. And the performance should now be exactly the same with or without reporting enabled. And the cluster operations should not be put at risk anymore. Eventually, the report system will be down. But it doesn't matter for the API server. It's going to continue working well, and it won't impact the cluster just because uh, the report system is down. So we're probably going to lose 
a few reports, but <laughs> it's better to lose reports than <laughs> to break the cluster. Um, so yes, and as a bonus, having the reports in a relational database is a good thing because you can potentially query those reports with um, standard SQL statements, SQL statements in English. So yeah, that, that can make sense uh, even from a business point of view. Uh, on top of that, uh, some clusters were simply too large to enable a report. It would have uh, immediately um, blocked ETCD entirely. So this enables those new, uh, those extremely large clusters to use reporting. Finally, uh, it doesn't benefit only to Kiverno. It can be uh, useful for other projects too, as long as uh, they use the policy report CRDs, uh, like Trivi, for example, because it doesn't require any code change. Everything happens in the API server. So now we have a quick case study before concluding the session. Uh, on the left, uh, we have a cluster without report server. On the right, a cluster with report server. And then we measured the um, ETCD storage consumed uh, at different level of pods and reports. So there's 17 policies installed in those clusters from the pod security standards. And you can see that on the left, um, the ETCD storage space grows rapidly. And on the right, it stays relatively flat where the report server is installed. The final conclusion is that uh, at 10,000 spots, the ETC CD storage size is reduced by more than 70% with the report server, saving a significant amount of storage space for regular API server operations. And yeah, that's it. Uh, it's almost the end of this session. So if there's a single thing to remember, it's that Kiverno report system represents a non-neglectable uh, risk at high scales. And it's absolutely not safe to store reports in ETCD above a certain size. Uh, for those big clusters, the report server makes a huge difference highly reducing the operational risks and preserving the performance of the cluster. It's very easy to install, just an M chart. So you deploy the M chart and you're done. You can bring your own database if needed. You can bring your own cloud managed instance, for example, for reduced maintenance if it's perfectly fine. And yeah, don't take an unnecessary risk if you operate a big cluster, give it a try and give us feedback and help us improve things. So yeah, you have the link to the GitHub repository, everything is available there. I think we're almost at the end. Maybe we can have one or two questions, if any. So I don't know. You have a question? Oh, Hello. Sorry. Uh, I'm wondering, what, what does a large cluster look like? Like, let's say you have uh, 200 nodes and a few hundred new pods an hour. Is that something where you'd think you'd have an issue, or are we talking like much bigger clusters than that? I think we're talking about much bigger clusters, but it also depends on the number of policies. So mm -hmm. it's probably a combination of number of resources and number of policies. And also the activity matters because the more admission requests, the more processing you will have to do. Uh, I think it's hard to give. Um, okay, but I guess it would it'd basically be like number of uh, like number of nodes or pods times number of policies would be like a general risk factor. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Uh, I, I don't know much about Kiverno. I haven't looked into it too much, so I have a, this might be a naive, naive question. Can you load policies from file instead of from CRD objects? Like from an empty dir that's managed by a sidecar? You can do that. The CLI does just that. Um, 
but of course, if you're in a Kubernetes cluster, it's um, easier to load them from the, uh, from the control plane. Uh, you can watch them. If something changes, you get notified and things like this. Uh, but yes, I guess you could have a complete provider. Okay. I think we have to Thanks. stop, but we can continue with the questions in the corridor, okay? So.